Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Yes, that is the Song of Solomon, um, chapter 1, verse 2. And I remember thinking, as a young teenage girl who had not fully given her heart to God, but was raised in a good Christian home, my friend and I would go through the Song of Solomon and just laugh hysterically. We were new to all the emotional verbiage in Song of Solomon and curious, and we just absolutely had the craziest time reading through the Shulamite's love for the shepherd, not really connecting it until many years later of the love of God for his people. So when I start reading the Song of Solomon, I always go back to those days of laughing with one of my best friends. And um, I want to take you there today. Good morning, Micah 7-7. What a way to start the day. Yes, sounds like a a Harlequin romance novel, right? (laughs) But this morning, I want to introduce you to a spirit of intimacy with our precious Lord and Savior. We're opening up this entire month of February to the love of God. We called it the angles of love, but this first week is about entering into an intimate relationship with God and knowing Him. And hopefully by the end of this devotional, we will look at that word, knowing Him, in a whole different light. But first of all, let's go to the word wine (laughs) in Psalms chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, we're not condoning it or um, talking about it either way, but wine is a drink of intoxication. Some people use it for social purposes and whatever, but in general, when you look at the Bible, it is talking about something that can cause your mood to relax, something that they celebrated with they did communion communion with um it but let's talk about what wine does when you have too much it is intoxicating now i have never been intoxicated with wine (laughs) but i happen to look it up and intoxication the positive aspect is a strong sense or feeling of happiness and excitement and i love how the Song of Solomon compares the love of God to something that the world seeks for to satisfy. You know, when you really parallel the love of the Shulamite and the shepherd to Jesus and the church, it changes this entire book. It really does. And especially if you dive into it in a matter of pursuing the love of God and and knowing and understanding. So let's go back before we hit chapter four. I want us to go back to the very beginning in Genesis. And the Lord created Adam and Eve. He took her um, out of his out of his ribs and created the woman for him. And um, then in the garden they knew one another. They they were naked and they were unashamed. And it was a beautiful thing until sin entered into the world. And when you look into the next phase of their life, the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, Eve. And we understand the King James Version of that is that there was an intimate relationship that produced children. And um, so, when you at that word knowing has a powerful meaning it basically means intimacy with god i like to i've heard this saying many times and i want to i want to repeat it again that the prodigal son if he would have ever known the love of the father he would have never left the house that's a, that's a very strong statement because there is many prodigals that have had strong relationships with god but to know him in such an intimate way, to know his love, to have that place in God that very few pursue and obtain. 
is a place that you never can go away. You can never leave that love of the Father. Now, the prodigal son understood that when he came back home. And many times it takes us having prodigal moments in our life, prodigal days, prodigal years, that we have not truly known him. Yes, just like my my husband and I, we, we dated and I loved him and I felt such a connection with him. But I didn't know him till after we were married. I didn't truly know him in both a physical sense and a, an emotional, mental, full, whole sense of that relationship. And that is what happens many times people profess to be Christians. They profess the faith, but they truly don't have that intimacy with God, knowing Him, that oneness, that unity that comes through a seasoned life of prayer and the Word. So let's go to Song of Solomon chapter 4. Verse 10 says, How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. And if you've ever had the Lord reveal this passage of Scripture to you, my sister and my spouse implies a bond as close as that of Adam and Eve and introduces each stage of intimacy from the delight of just seeing her presence and and then knowing her love and her fragrance and, and then finally that consummation and that celebration of their union. He is calling her something that he is separate from anyone else. There's no one else like my spouse. And then verse 12 says, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. And then he describes in verse 13 and 14 and 15 these fragrances and these pleasant fruits and um, all of the the very best of the best. And verse 15 says, A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, a stream from Lebanon. That is showing us when when we compare it to our relationship with God, our, our times alone, that secret place, that closet prayer life, that secret garden that we spend time with the Lord, that time that we connect with Him in such a beautiful way that we walk out of that place filled with the aroma of His presence in our life. And it's there is nothing, nothing like it that compares. And He can take us to heights of His Spirit that there is peace the world can never know. There is satisfaction. There is a longing that it drives us to pursue more of His presence. And today we're talking about the love of God, but I want to take it home with us today. That intimacy with the Lord, nothing can ever compare. There's no physical relationship that can ever compare to intimacy with God. When we become one with Him, one with His mindset, one with His heartbeat, one with His passion for the world, then our desires change. The Bible says, delight yourself also in the Lord and He shall give you the desires of your heart. But as you delight in Him and you find those areas of your life begin to change and align with His heart and His delight. And verse 16 says, Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south, blow upon my garden. Now this is the garden that has been cultivated in prayer. That the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. As we walk with the Lord, as we grow in the Lord, as we become intimate with him, then these beautiful, the winds of adversity can come. The winds from the north are considered winds of adversity. The winds from the south are considered the winds that um, warm us. So when winds blow of good times and bad times, all it does is it stirs up those sweet smelling spices that we have we have cultivated in prayer for the world to smell and see you know life happens and they don't change there is still a strong connection with the lord and those things only come in the secret garden well i want to take you to philippians in um philippians chapter three and this is some of my favorite settings of scripture here 
before I do though, I want you to consider something. In this life, intimacy with Christ will always bring conception. God will always birth something in us when we find our fulfillment in His love, in His presence, when we find what the world cannot give us, when we love Him above comfort food and uh, entertainment and pleasures and, and all these things. When we find Jesus and we place Him in that position in our life, there is nothing that will compare. Okay? And I believe that that's where the springs of everything we do for God should come from. I believe it should be born in prayer. It should be birthed in us. We can do a lot of activities. We can work, quote unquote, work for the Lord and have ministries and and, and do great charitable deeds. But if it's not birthed in the secret garden, then many times we get burned out. We get tired. We're weary. But I, I thought about this as I close today. When we stand before Jesus, there will be a day that we all stand before Him. And I don't believe that it's going to be our works, our activities, all these things that we won't be able to justify or boast about what we did for Him. But our boasting will be in that we knew Him, that we knew Him in the power of His Spirit in that secret garden. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Verse 9 says, And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Verse 10, That I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. My friends, I I don't know about you, but if I can gain one thing in this world, it would be to know my Lord and my Savior, to really know Him, not know of Him, but to taste and see His goodness, to meet Him in that secret garden. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your love. There is nothing that compares to you, Father. And Lord, in our human way, God, that we we look at love and we see it as a, just a just a, sometimes abused, sometimes misused, but love is sacrifice love is giving up of ourselves to become one with something greater and lord we want your love we want to know you we want to be intimate with you god and so as we do i pray that you would birth something in us conceive something in us god that will change our world change our mindset our perception god that we can connect with your heartbeat with your desires and your passions and you're ready to meet us in the secret garden and you have spices to pour on us God that the world will be able to pick up the aroma of your presence in our life and so today God I ask blessings upon your people that you would call us in to the secret place in Jesus precious name thank you so much for joining me this morning this month Let's pursue knowing God. God bless. Have a great day.